Bruce, um, Jean Lewis. Jean, if you'll come on up. Jean, actually, I think we'll find her on the stage back here. Jean Lewis, uh, Sapient Computer Consulting's Public Services Lead. Jean. Uh, we need a mic for Jean. Okay. Thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. Again, I'm Jean Lewis. I'm a director at Sapient Public uh, Sapient Consulting in our public sector federal civilian business unit. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Mr. Daryl Peake from the director. He's the director of operations from the Office of the Chief Administration, uh, Chief um, uh, Information Office, Chief Technology Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Specifically, Mr. Peak has a keen interest and is in the process of exploring how emerging technologies such as blockchain can be leveraged to advance their mission in law enforcement and national security. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Mr. Peak to the stage. Thank you. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing today? Good. We have a, a great session so far. I think many of the one through five, if you are one, maybe you're three now. If you are five, maybe you're seven. And those who are already tens, continue to enjoy. So, so one of the things that we have, and we're excited, this is the second block, and I, I was thinking about the three-ring circus. Remember how you had to move your head from side to side to catch everything, but this is the second block of this summit. And as we continue to talk about blockchain, why is DHS interested? Of course, we have many use cases that are the back office applications. So if you think about financial services, if you think about human capital, if you think about the number of contracts, the number of assets that we have within our organization, it becomes a real scenario. But also making sure that it's business relevant, that we aren't investing for the sake of investing in new technology, but we are looking to bring value to our customers, that we're still doing the necessary market research to understand what's going on. So with that being said, we have three presenters who will be presenting during the session, and they're going to wow us with their blockchain implementations. Now, as they go through this, I want you to pay close attention, because we will not have any Q&A, but we're going to encourage you to see the tables after the session. And I will excuse and, and introduce the next speaker. Now, we want to have you to hold all uh, questions until the end. And first up, we will have Chris Dodden, Chief Innovation Officer of the National Democratic Institute. Uh, Chris, come on up. All right, let's give Chris a hand. You mic'd up? Okay. Check, check. All right, great. Hey, folks. So my name is Chris Doden. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at NDI, the National Democratic Institute. It's sort of the worst name ever because we're international and we're nonpartisan, and I'm not sure what an institute is. But we work on fostering government accountability, uh, citizen access, and transparency in government in about 60 countries around the world. Been doing it for about 30 years. I'm here to tell you a little bit today about a new initiative we're engaged in called the Blockchain Trust Accelerator. We're working together with the New America Foundation and Bitfury, a uh, full-service blockchain and Bitcoin mining company, to think about the ways that we can use blockchain to promote mm -hmm. social good-based causes around the world. Um, and we, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, blockchain can work not just to solve individual uh, problems, you know, speeding processes or making things um, a little bit better, but how it might help a, a bit with our, our whole systems of government and the institutions of democracy broadly. So, you know, at the risk of sounding like the opening scroll in a sci-fi movie, it's kind of a dark time for democratic institutions and governments around the world. Um, you know, it seems like it's a time where citizens are having trouble uh, distinguishing between what's real and what's fake, um, where uh, a recent Edelman survey indicated that trust across the board is at an all-time low in institutions, governments, corporations, the nonprofit sector, and media. And you know, how do we have um, a kind of democratic systems operate in this, with this sort of trust deficit? And when people don't believe necessarily in what their government does anymore. So I'm not in the hype business. You spend enough time developing technology solutions in places like Zimbabwe, and you'll realize quickly that the tools are really the easiest part of the solution and that there are no sil silver bullets in this space. However, we do at NDI and with Blockchain Trust Accelerator, I think there's real potential for uh, blockchain to help solve some of these trust issues around the world. 
it's designed to facilitate um, engagement among people who may not fully trust each other. And so with that, you know, we can build records, we can build processes that are more secure and transparent, records and contracts that are more uh, easily accessible and resistant to corruption. Um, so we see a wide range of public good opportunities that we're starting to develop, and I'll give you a couple examples in just a minute here. So, you know, ensuring fair elections, uh, promoting property rights, maintaining the integrity of official records, um, identifying people and securing, say, aid delivery supply chains. So, you know, we're all here because blockchain is the new hotness. Uh, there's billions of dollars of investment in the fintech sector. But we at NDI as a, a development organization are really concerned about the social good applications and implications here. How do we bootstrap development in this new space for, um, for social good focused organizations, nonprofits, and particularly for governments? So our goal with the Blockchain Trust Accelerator project is to build understanding in this technology and deliver benefits for society while it's still in its infancy and can kind of be shaped with an eye on uh, the social good. So the Blockchain Trust Accelerator is a nonprofit collaboration between these three organizations I described earlier. The goal to get all the right people in the room to help some of these pilot projects happen at the speed of technology firms rather than necessarily traditional government procurement processes. So we're building and testing projects to help organizations increase accountability, transparency, or build citizen trust. Um, and we think that by building for social good, we can unlock a whole different side of the potential of this exciting new technology. So what's our goal? We want to find potential pilot ideas serving real people who have real problems. We want to, uh, our technical team with the Bitfury side are going to develop software pro bono for organizations and then we're going to experiment, see what succeeds and what fails. This is a new technology. We should all expect to have a lot of failures here. But we need to communicate about what's going on, what works and what doesn't, and then try and learn from each other as we move forward with this. So, and then with that, we can take the best ideas and then scale them out and promote them across, across this space. Now, the Blockchain Trust Accelerator is relatively new. We've uh, only been around for about a year here, but we've had a few exciting pilot projects already. Uh, the most notable um, is working with the government of the Republic of Georgia on a land registry titling program, not dissimilar to what we heard with, with Sweden here. The properties of the, uh, the immutability of the ledger um, the, uh, make it very, very useful for any sort of project that has to do with titling, licensing, that sort of stuff. Um, if you have a, uh, a particularly prime piece of property in the North Caucasus, if the uh, brother of the, the, the registrar of deeds in Georgia decides that he really wants a part of that, then you can't, uh, he can't simply just go grab it from you because every single deed actually is linked to, a, um, to the, blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain in a way that makes any sort of transfers um, immediately obvious to anybody. So um, in the United Kingdom, we're also working, uh, we've completed a polling project, a pilot project, polling. Well, when you think about polling, what are you doing? You're trying to find, you find an individual and you get their opinion on a particular thing and they only uh, uh, issue it once and you make sure that it's valid going forward. It sounds a lot like voting. So we think that this sort of technology has a, a great deal of potential um, for, um, for making elections more open, transparent, and, um, and accountable in the future. So, and then one, I'm just about to, to head off to Liberia to work with um, a upcoming election there. Very tense situation. Um, and disinformation and fake news is a global problem. It's not just here in the United States. Um, there were recent elections in Kenya, uh, you may have seen, where fake news had huge implications for, uh, for the electorate and led to some, some violence. We're very concerned in the Liberian context that similar things might happen. So we're developing a uh, blockchain notarization service for very important documents. For example, um, uh, the, the election monitoring results that come out, such that people can't take them, manipulate them, and push them back out in an explosive political atmosphere. So we think that this can kind of uh, help fight back a little bit against problems of, of you know, disinformation and fake news. Um, I suppose if you define fake news as anything you don't like, then that will continue to be an issue, but uh, we can take some aspects of that. There's about another dozen pilot projects in the pipeline. 
Um, and uh, we're working on different things in identity, uh, healthcare, uh, title records, and supply chain. And so up to this point, we've had a wide variety of conversations with federal, state, and local governments here in the United States and around the, uh, the world with the Blockchain Trust Accelerator. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, we'd love to hear about your ideas for a pilot project for some, with some sort of social good need. So we're going to evaluate them to see which ones have the most impact and are most likely to be uh, scalable in the future. Um, and then we'll build something out. Then document the process and share it with communities like this to try and help policymakers better understand the implications of this technology and experiment and innovate. You know, people talk often about how we're at the early stages of blockchain here, just as we would be in the early days of the internet. Most of us wouldn't have had, um, I certainly wouldn't have had the vision to see what the internet would become in the future. We really think this is something where we have to kind of let a, a thousand flowers bloom, experiment with different things and run with uh, as many different ideas as we can. We hope the Blockchain Trust Accelerator will make that a little bit easier and faster. Now, I'm an international development guy. Maybe I read too much uh, dystopic uh, sci-fi, but it is important in a place like this where we all get super jazzed to remember some of the dark sides of this stuff. And you have to think, like, what are the second order co uh, consequences of any of these sorts of things? First of all, this is all, you know, any sort of strong technology underpinning like this is going to affect people differently um, depending on how marginalized they already are. The, the disempowered tend to be um, even further isolated when new systems like this come into play, despite the potential that they may have. So, you know, keep an eye out for those who don't have the same sorts of uh, access to technology. Um, in many places, women encounter technology differently from men, people who are linguistic minorities or other people like that. And then also, you know, what does it mean if we have a permanent, irrevocable record of every transaction that ever takes place? Um, that can often be um, tied back to whether people think so or not to an individual. Uh, we really have to think about what are the long-term privacy implications for all this stuff as we move uh, in the future for this. So I'll be hanging out in the back here. We'd love to talk about the Blockchain Trust Accelerator with any of you um, who have any ideas here. And then hopefully we can uh, come back next year and talk about some of your pilot ideas that we uh, got up and running. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, next, we have another exciting presentation with Dr. Victoria Adams, Senior Technologist, Booz Allen Hamilton. Hello. Let me move this thing. It's always trouble being tall. So, big number, $2.8 trillion. Trillion. It's a big number. You know what it is? It's the number of unreconciled, tra it's the dollar value of unreconciled transactions in the federal government in FY, the first quarter of this year. 2.8 trillion, isn't that incredible? You know what's amazing? It's down from six trillion. Our friends at the treasury did a fantastic job, but it took them a lot of work. And what's the obvious solution to an unreconciled balance? Blockchain, right? Blockchain, 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 all that stuff. I'm that person in the firm that anybody brings up a problem, I say, blockchain! <laughs> you know, they can solve that. You know, coffee's not made. Oh, blockchain. You know, it's like I can't, you know, I won't get into my ideas. So we said at Booz Allen, let's do this as a moonshot, but let's not do it with a client. Let's challenge ourselves. If we had to solve this problem, what would the solution to the problem be? What kind of technological barriers would we have to get over? So we brought together technologists. We brought together some of our competitors. We brought together the best minds we could find in academe, in accounting. We brought some of our SMEs in. We brought everybody we could think in. And we sat them down. And we started to map out how we could solve this problem and what would be the solution. This is a big deal. Think about it. The basic thing of government is to move money around because money makes things happen. Mm -hmm. And if you can't move the money and you don't know where it goes, you're spending a ton of money reconciling that. Every government department working on something here, something there, all over the place. And then think more as you go into it. All the fees that you're incurring moving money around. This is kind of the thing why people hate government. It gets lost, you can't explain it. 
And it's inevitable when we live in this environment of continuing resolutions, of multiple legacy systems, of priorities constantly changing. You know this, you work in this. It's so difficult to keep track of things. So how can blockchain help? So we started to build this. And you can see out there, you know, a little dummy system we've built, which is some of the first sort of stirrings in this and how you would transfer money. It does all kinds of things in treasury functions and has repo contracts and all kinds of fancy stuff using the blockchain. It's not very interesting to look at because blockchain isn't interesting <laughs> to look at. Things happen. Money gets transferred. A balance changes. So what did we find out when we went into this? The first thing we found was that blockchain alone is not and can never be the whole of the solution. Other technologies play a critical part. We found that RPA, robotic process automation, is critical for interfacing with legacy systems in an efficient manner. We find increasingly that machine intelligence is a key enabler of many processes that are triggered by blockchain. We started to build these and put these together. And what we find even more was culture. Culture, culture, culture. Culture is everything. This is the thing you're going to have to change. You have to educate people, you have to explain what's happening, and you have to figure out who needs to know. There's a whole bunch of financial like, technologies behind when I get money out of an ATM. I could care less. I just want my money. And similarly, when it's coming to blockchain and introducing it, you've got to be able to pitch it to the right point. We're all blockchain enthusiasts and we want to explain things to people. But sometimes that just makes it worse. So, you know, we got to control it. We got to see how it works. So we find culture and education are critical. The second thing we found was that domain SME knowledge is the, is the key thing you have to get, more important than anything else. The nuances of smart contracts are so important that if you're going to do something like, can I put my procurement system on the blockchain? How can I manage smart property? All of these issues that we've, we've been dealing with and working with the clients on. When you're enabling those smart contracts, you really have to understand what's going on. A goes to B, B goes to C, what happens if there's a D, you know? How can this contract end? Do I really want to keep all this information? Where can I download it to? And also to understand what are the regulatory requirements they have to follow. These things are vital. You absolutely have to have the domain SMEs in there from the beginning. This is not a technology problem. This is a business problem that technology can help you solve. And you must approach it that way. What's the third thing that we found? Legacy systems. It's going to have to work with legacy systems. It's going to have to come together with those existing systems. And you need to really think, why are you doing this? What's the value you're generating here? Can the legacy system do this? Do I need to put this part on the blockchain? How is that going to function? What are the off-ramps and the on-ramps into the system? Do they compromise it? Are we creating more problems? So working with those legacy systems we found to be a critical thing as we pushed out. Now, one thing that we did find was that the technology is not that much of a problem. There are new, very user-friendly things emerging that if you get, you know, the smart kids, the millennials, the ones that we all hate, because um, <laughs> they're entitled, no. Um, no, I love them, I love them. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Don't like my own kids very much because they're really entitled. But, you know, if you think about that, those kids are coming in, they've got the technology, they can get it. There's a lot of platforms being developed. We're platform agnostic. We'll steal and borrow and take from anybody if it helps us along. There's a lot of things out there. So technology is becoming less of a problem. So you can structure it that way. So that was sort of the good news that came out of this. We found things are heavy lift, but you can get there fast. How much more time have I got? Out of three minutes. About three minutes, okay. So. So that was the good news. So putting all this together, we put together a series of teams that started to work on this. And we developed some prototypes, and like I say, they're out there and you can do that. But just think if we can solve this problem, if we collectively in this room, all the federal folks in here and the contractor community, because really there's nothing that differs us, you know, we just work for different people. But we're all facing the same problems. Because if we can do money, we can do data. And if we can do data, we can start to change and transform the federal government. 
We can break down the silos. We can create a government for the 21st century that is going to knock people's socks off in terms of performance, in terms of the achievements that we can make. And I find that tremendously exciting, that this technology in combination with other technologies that we are seeing is going to transform government over the next 20 years. It is going to recreate government in a way that is trustworthy, that is effective in performing its core functions and delivers benefits to the people that we serve, the citizenry. And I really believe that we're there at this point. So I would just say this is a call to action. You guys are on the cusp of something marvelous. And let's all work together and change the world. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Um, so the key, three key themes, and I, I thought that was really uh, uh, accurate, what she said around culture, uh, domain expertise, and legacy systems. Um, looking at that as a means of how to really implement it and the dependency there is within a lot of our, our legacy networks. And last but not least, we have Mark Fisk, who is a partner at IBM Digital Global Business Services. Mark. Good morning, everybody, and uh, two reasons I'm really happy to be here today. First, thanks to Mr. White, I don't have to do Blockchain 101. So <laughs> any of you who are out there trying to do Blockchain 101, you start to think about it in your you know, embedded night. It is, it, so it was, a, it was a great great overview that you gave today. Um, the second thing is we're talking about government. And uh, so I've been in public sector for 25 years. And uh, you know, one of the challenges that I've had is to try to think about all the great things that are going on in commercial and figure out how they apply to government. So um, I was definitely one of the uh, naysayers at the beginning, and I'm one of the uh, converts now. And I want to take you through that journey a little bit. But really what I want to focus on is kind of the top question, since I don't have to do Blockchain 101, the next top question is how to get started with blockchain and government, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a key thing that everybody in the room here should be able to do uh, in the near future here. So basically, it starts off with value, value to the business network. Whatever that business network is, whatever that you know ecosystem is that's out there, right? There needs to be value associated with that business network. For government, what I want to share with you is, you know, having been to over 50 different state and local federal agencies talking about blockchain, there's three themes that I hear about in government, right? There's many more on the list, but this is my top three. Number one is the data sharing. It's kind of the table stakes, right? It's just table stakes to start with blockchain. You heard a lot about it today. Um, I think that also extends to concepts like open government. So I know that Justin Herman is leading something over at GSA around emerging technology and open government. I think that's a great place to you know, put some of those foundational data sharing capabilities. Um, but that's not enough. The next piece is security, okay? And so data sharing is great, but you have to know who you're sharing data with, when, why, for what purpose, and maybe it's temporarily, right? And so the security of the blockchain has got to both protect the people from the outside from getting in, but it's also going to implement privacy from the inside, right? So in that blockchain network, not everybody is equal. Right? And it's got to be able to support that level of access, that level of controls, that level of I'm just not a member of the network and that's why I'm seeing the data. I need to see this data or I need to see this subset of data. Right? So it's data sharing but with the um, privacy and the security that's needed. And then the third piece is the piece that I'm most passionate about which is that in government, a lot of times the government entity is driving that business network. That business network might not even exist if it wasn't for that government entity. My favorite example there is the FAFSA. So I have one in college, one heading to college, two okay. more that eventually will hopefully get to college, right? Um, how, how many of you have been through the FAFSA process? See, all those people are groaning, you know, when I mention that, right? So you think about, and, and, and they've done a lot of improvements in, in, in what they've done going forward, but if you think about that business network, right, you have that business network 
of the IRS and Social Security and the Department of Education and the higher education universities you have, right? And me, I want to selectively choose to share what information I want to share with whom, when, for what purpose, right? Understanding what they're going to do with it. And then, you know, when my son's done with school, I'm going to take it off. Why do they need to still have that information, right? So it's that concept of that business network and the fact that government entities, um, it was brought up earlier, Nobody owns a blockchain, but a government entity can be the one who sponsors or brings together that blockchain. And that's where I think it's going to happen. So three quick examples from commercials. So I had a slide that I was going to show with a bunch of commercial examples, and then half of them were already talked about by the time I get up here. So um, that was good news. Um, but in, if you think about those, there was three kind of examples I'd like you to take. Uh, the first one is any of the zero through fives out here, just search on Google for IBM Global financing blockchain, okay? It's the best example involving dispute resolution that is out there that'll help you to understand the value of blockchain and how a blockchain can be created without major changes to your legacy systems, okay? That's a common fallacy that I wanna um, kind of address right now. The second one that's out there is a brand new one, uh, the Digital Trade Chain Consortium. So this is a group of seven banks that got together in Europe to help small businesses with banking services. Okay, so now switch that to your government hat. Think about a way where you have members of the business network that are working on a blockchain and then providing those services out to citizens, to small businesses. Not everybody has to necessarily be on a direct connect to the blockchain, right? You can get that access and information and value through other members of the business network. So I'd like you to think about that one. And then the third one you probably have heard about, which is the Walmart case around uh, food safety. Um, but what you may not have heard about is about three weeks ago, there was a major announcement. So this is an example where Walmart created a permission to blockchain, much like a lot of the agencies I've been talking to are thinking about around a very tactical business problem that they have. What they've then now done is taken that blockchain and expanded it out and connected it into a global food safety network. So with um, Nestle, Unilever, and a bunch of other uh, companies, grocers, uh, government entities around the world, they're establishing this global food safety network. So think about it. You can take and start working and get value from your blockchain for your tactical problem in your business network. And then you can connect that to a broader business network that can then leverage that information. And I really think with government and with all the interactions between agencies and federal and state and local and commercial entities, that that's a great model, okay? So just three examples from commercial, but again, commercial, federal, state and local, same challenges. I need a common problem that I have a business network that needs to solve, and I need to be able to go back and then leverage what is value for each of those members of the business network. Right, and I will give a pitch. I think design thinking is an awesome way to go address that in a business network because you need to get that perspective from all the members. So if I have one minute left, um, I want to introduce Paul DiPietro to come up with me. So we talked about how you get started with blockchain. So over here today, we're gonna show you a project that's probably about four weeks old, right? Concept, uh, Paul's gonna tell you about for one minute to implementation with a real blockchain using Hyperledger Composer to actually create the schema. Just to show you guys, this is something that's out there that's real that you can actually you know, pick around and try and try out ideas, right? I think that's the most important thing I tell you today. Get, you know, I'm not pushing any particular you know, technology or information, right? But get working with blockchain and see the value. And I did want to disagree with one point that Dr. Adams made. I think that UI UX is key in being able to show the value of blockchain. So I think one of the biggest things you'll see there is these abstract concepts we've been talking about today are really hard for me to understand, but if I can see it and understand it and visualize it, it helps. So I'd really encourage anybody that's going through a POC, make sure you include um, a good user experience as part of that. So one minute for Paul. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and I'll probably take more about 30 seconds, but I uh, just want to take a moment to, to introduce um, and to provide just a little bit of context around what we're showing here, because it is, I think, hard to uh, sort of comprehend, and that's why we're trying to develop these uh, fairly simplistic uh, demonstrations, yet both show 
um, the u user experience, uh, in this case a mobile app that we have today, um, but also the back end and what's happening uh, with respect to um, data being written to the blockchain. So um, in this uh, particular demonstration, we're showing uh, data interoperability among various stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder environment, in this case an air environment, an airport environment. Uh, we're showing public and private uh, and international uh, partners all, all collaborating in real time in a business network. Uh, and we're trying to discover how that drives value and how that's different from the way that data is exchanged today, which is primarily in a more of a bilateral entity-to-entity um, uh, you know, -entity environment. Um, and we also have uh, a piece that shows how the passenger would benefit and interact uh, with the business network. So it's fairly conceptual. It's not a product. It's not an app that uh, would be rolled out to either a government stakeholder or a uh, passenger, but a little bit of a mix of both. So um, please come by, ask questions, uh, and we look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks. And then the uh, millennial on my team that everybody hates will be happy to show you the technology. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mark Paul. Uh, so let's give one more round of applause for all of our speakers. So this has been an exciting look at some of the uh, blockchain exploration that is being done. Um, once again, please visit some of the tables uh, and see their technology and ask any questions that you may have had during the talk. Now we're going to ask you to direct to the front of the stage. Uh, R.K. Palillo from Booz Island Hamilton will be taking us into our next panel.